all for being here. It's just lovely to see you. Uh, this event is for you. It is for the students, it's for the public, uh, it's, it's for all of us to build bridges with one another and uh, build community. As we go forward to uh, fight climate change, it's going to take all of us. So this is just a great opportunity for that. But before I tell you that, I, um, I have some people to thank. Um, uh, so, as, as Patty said, uh, I am with 350 Ventura County Climate Hub, and I have to tell you that the, the group has been so supportive and inspirational. It's just been wonderful to work with them. And uh, we did approach Patty, it's been a couple months ago now, uh, to get this thing going, and uh, she's just been wonderful to work with. And so we wanted to thank uh, Ventura College for, for hosting us here. Yay! Thank you. Also, we have some co-sponsors that I'm just really uh, grateful for, and that would be uh, the League of Women Voters. <laughs> and also Citizens for Peaceful Resolutions. So, I, I, I'm just so appreciative uh, for all of your trust and care that we could pull this off, and that means a lot. So thank you very much for that. And then uh, we have CAPS TV. Yes, CAPS TV. Uh, CAPS TV is uh, filming this, so we'll have access to it. Uh, we'll be able to watch it on our local TV, and then we'll have a DVD here for the college so that they can use it in the future. Okay, so uh, we'll be doing the first segment on uh, climate change science for our students, uh, so they'll gr they can have a, a handle on that. And for those of you who are already very familiar with climate science, uh, uh, bear with us, and, and uh, the solutions will be right up. And then following that, Patty is, of course, going to run a very dynamic um, uh, Q&A, and we've got the tabling out there. So build community, love each other. Let's change this and turn things around. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so I would like to introduce Dr. Omar Clay. He earned a PhD in physics and biophysics from UCSD in 2006. He's an associate with the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation. He studied both nuclear and biological weapons policy and technologies. In, in the course of that work, he realized that environmental and climatic issues are the most urgent and most compelling challenges facing our civilization. And for the past decade, Dr. Clay has been involved in the study of air quality, water quality, and coastal pollution in Baja California Norte as the research director of science for the people. He also teaches environmental science at several universities where he engage, engages with students from around the world. Dr. Clay? Hello, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Wow, what a bunch of great, great faces here. I'm really excited to be a part of this. I'm going to have to speak a little quickly because I'm going to try to present climate science uh, in, in its entirety to you. And there's a lot involved with the how and the what. Oh, my apologies. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'll try that again. Uh, I'm going to try to cover the how, the what, and the why of climate science. And I'm going to do it rather quickly um, in order that I can fit into this allocated time. But hopefully, if there's any questions, you can hit me up after in questions and answers. And so, so let's just kind of start. And before I do, I, I have to address what's an elephant in the room, which is that scientists are, are really strongly in consensus about the data that I'm going to show you and about the implications of climate science. But in our public discourse, there's a real discord about climate science. And you might wonder why that is. If scientists are so sure about this stuff, why is it so, so controversial? And unfortunately, what we have, and now I'm a physical scientist, so I can't speak with authority about these subjects, so I'm going to direct you to some social scientists. In particular, here is Robert Brule, who has followed the money from corporations like Exxon and uh, the Koch uh, Foundation to a variety of different think tanks and private organizations who have been involved in you know, undermining the public's understanding about climate science. And, and so I'm just going to give you an example of that with the Heritage Organization. Here's a billboard that they placed in, in Chicago several years ago, which uh, compares those of us that take climate science seriously to a domestic terrorist, the Unabomber. 
Uh, and they've also apparently sent out a lot of documentation to K through 12 public school teachers about how they should actually not teach climate science. And I only learned about this from, from the, uh, the National Science Teachers uh, Association. So I, I want to make you aware of that. I know here in California people are a, a little bit more in tune with, with what's actually going on with our climate. But this is a, a significant issue in our public dialogue. It's not the first time we've seen a disinformation campaign uh, that's been funded by powerful uh, organizations like, in this case, the tobacco industry. Naomi Oreskes, a, uh, a sociologist at uh, Harvard, really gets into the details of this. Um, but uh, the tobacco industry effectively staved off regulation on tobacco products by undermining the public's understanding of, of the science of the linkage between the use of those products and the health uh, impacts. And we're seeing a very similar thing with the fossil fuel industry today. So I kind of have to start with that. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I'll get to the science here in a minute. And I'll just mention that right now we have a number of attorney generals from a variety of states that are actively investigating the uh, Exxon and several other fossil fuel industries about the fact that they've misinformed the public because there's been some uh, releases of internal documents inside climate news has has got documents from exxon corporation demonstrating that they knew well about climate science in the late 70s and early 80s and that they have actively chosen to undermine the public's understanding of the subject so th so let's get to the real science of the subject so what are the facts of global warming is is the planet warming well, we have a, about 100 years of uh, climate data, and the 10 hottest years on record all occurred in the last 20 years. The four hottest years on record occurred in the last four years. Is it, is it climate warming? Absolutely. Here's a global surface average temperature measurement over since 1880. And, and here I'm going to show that same data again, but just to give you a sense of what the scientific debate about global warming looks like. Four different independent organizations here, uh, the, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, NOAA, the UK Met it, and uh, NOAA. Uh, NOAA is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, in case you didn't know. And then, and then also NASA have uh, published their records. You can see that they're not in complete agreement with one another. But this is what the discord in the scientific community looks like about global warming today. So that one and a half degrees Fahrenheit rise in the last century may not look like much on average, and maybe it isn't. Part of the reason it doesn't seem like much is because there's a real geographical variation in warming on our planet. We're, we've got land masses that already have three or four degrees of uh, increase in temperature in the last century. You'll notice that the sea surface temperatures have not increased as much as, 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 uh, as the land surface temperatures. And you can see here in the brown is, the, is land surface temperature on average, and in blue is sea surface temperature on average. And you might guess why that would be as you warm water. A lot of that heat energy is getting convected into the depths of the ocean. So right now, all of the changes we're seeing on global warming in our terrestrial environment is just a sliver of what's actually going on on our planet. About 90% of the heat energy that the planet's accumulated in the last five or six decades is in our oceans. And that's, uh, that's a real issue. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, here's the sea sur surface temperature uh, anomaly. For, uh, and I wanted to point out that there's geographical variations there also. And actually, some regions of the sea are actually cooling. And that's, that's ice melt off of, of Greenland up there. So why is it warming? This is the multi-trillion dollar question, right? Well, climate change is any time there's an imbalance in the amount of energy that the planet receives and the amount of energy the planet re re uh, emits. Remember that any, any object in our universe emits radiation based on how hot it is. And so w when anything changes I this balance, then the climate's either going to warm or cool, as it has historically. And one of the things that could happen, for instance, and does happen, is that the sun changes in, in its solar activity. So you see solar activity in the upper left here. And, and the sun is a dynamic entity in its own right. It has a 22-year cycle. And you can see that actually right now, the sun is decreasing slightly in intensity. It's certainly not gl driving global warming on the planet today. On the right-hand side, you can see there's, there's a number of ways that our planet varies. Uh, these are called Milankovitch cycles. The eccentricity of the elliptical orbit of Earth around the sun varies just a little bit on about a 100,000 year time scale. There's variations in the orientation of the axis, the rotational axis of our planet. There's some precession. These things are varying on about a 23,000 year uh, time scale and 140,000 year time scale. 
And then in the, in the lower left, you got the, or, I'm sorry, I've got the side uh, incorrect, but here in the, you see the greenhouse effect. A lot of the solar energy incident on, on our planet is reflected off of the surface of our atmosphere. Some of it's reflected off of the surface of the planet. And then you can see that energy is trapped also in the atmosphere. And this is this greenhouse effect. I'm sure everybody's heard of the greenhouse effect, but let's be clear about what greenhouse gases are. They're gases in our atmosphere that are transparent to the incoming incident visible solar energy, and then they're opaque to the outgoing thermal emissions of the planet. So they, they absorb and trap heat on the planet. And it's a good thing we have a greenhouse effect. This isn't a bad thing. If we didn't have a greenhouse effect, our planet would probably be about the same temperature as our moon. It's about the same distance from the sun. So th this is an important effect, but as we'll see, it, it can have a problem. So what scientists have done is very carefully measure all those climate forcings that I just mentioned. They're called climate forcing factors, along with a whole lot of other factors that I didn't mention. And they put together models, and they compare their models to what we actually see. So here in the black line is the observed surface temperature increase that you've already seen several times now. And then there's a number of models represented here, but models when they don't include the human activity cannot account for the warming we see. When we do include, include uh, human activity, we're, we have pretty good agreement between the models and observed temperature increase. And so how is it humans are affecting the climate? Well, I, I'm pretty sure people have a good sense of this. We're enhancing the greenhouse effect. We've put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and that's trapping more heat on the planet. But our models aren't the only reason we know that. There's a whole lot of other physical facts about the way that our planet's warming that makes it clear to scientists in general that it's due to this enhanced greenhouse effect. I'm just going to pull out one of these, and that is stratospheric cooling. The next time you have to en engage somebody who's a climate denialist who thinks that climate scientists are all bought off or something, you might ask them why it is that our upper atmosphere is cooling. The stratosphere, which is about 7 to 35 miles up, is the only part of our planet today that's cooling. And the, and the reason for that is because most of the greenhouse gases are underneath the stratosphere. And so they're trapping heat below the, uh, the stratosphere, and the stratosphere is not getting those thermal emissions that it used to get, and it's cooling. And, this, and of course, the thermal emissions are also not going out to outer space. So how is it that we're enhancing the greenhouse effect? And fossil fuel combustion is, is the primary culprit. Um, when you look at, you know, so here you can see some complete combustion reactions for methane and octane, uh, but with any fossil fuel, when you combust it, you produce CO2, you produce thermal energy, you pr produce water. These are called complete combustion reactions because these, these are uh, uh, written under the uh, assumption that you have an exact ratio between oxygen and fuel molecules. And of course, we never have that in reality, so you get a whole bunch of other pollutants when you uh, burn fossil fuels in our atmosphere. But this is what would happen if you had idealized circumstances, and even then you're going to get CO2 emissions. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have produced gigatons of carbon dioxide. As of now, we produce gigatons of carbon dioxide every single year. And you can see that in this graph. A gigaton is a billion tons. A ton is around 2,000 pounds. And we're talking about a gas. So you're talking about gigatons of a gas. You can imagine what that might mean in terms of the, the amount of gas we're putting into the atmosphere. And you might wonder where it goes. So these are 60 years of direct measurements of the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And it's gone up in 60 years, it's gone up by about 30%. So that's, that's, we are altering the chemical composition of the global atmosphere, and we're doing it rather rapidly. The other thing you can see in this slide is there's this little oscillation. That little, that's a seasonal variation that has to do, it's essentially the signature of our planet breathing. This is the northern forest when they bloom, sucking in carbon dioxide. As most of you will remember, probably from high school biology, when plants photosynthesize, they take in solar energy, they take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they create carbohydrates, animals like ourselves eat them, we metabolize it, we exhale carbon dioxide. And that's the natural carbon cycle. But what's happened is that humans have dug up fossilized carbon and combusted it. And so now we're getting no CO2 emissions, and it's driving the CO2 levels in our atmosphere up. The other way that we're creating climate change is that we have removed a lot of plant life from the surface of the planet. So deforestation is another means by which we drive climate change. Uh, this is an interesting graph because it gives you a, a, a sense of what the relative forcing is from 
greenhouse gas, I mean, uh, greenhouse gases from fossil fuel combustion, and then the la lo loss of plant life and other land use changes. So you see in brown land use changes, including deforestation, and then you see in gray what happens from our fossil fuel emissions. Cement production requires a lot of energy, so that also, and it's a fossil fuel combustion um, a process typically, and so that's also putting a lot of CO2 in the air. This graph also gives you some sense of where that carbon dioxide's going. In green, you can see plants absorbing it. Uh, in the light blue, you can see the atmospheric levels of CO2. We already talked about that. And then in dark blue, you can see a lot of CO2 gets into the oceans, the global oceans, and we'll talk about that briefly later. So scientists are very clear on this now. We have a, have a natural greenhouse effect, and we have this enhanced human greenhouse effect. This slide shows that, but it also shows that those greenhouse gases, it's not just CO2. So what other greenhouse gases are there, and, and how important are they? So let's look at that briefly. What, what we have now is we measure the thermal emissions from, from the planet, and when we do, we can compare those thermal emissions to what we would expect from another object of the same temperature, which you see here in red. And in, in the blue, you can see the actual measurements. And the difference between the two are these greenhouse gases in our atmosphere absorbing them. So we have a very clear sense of what greenhouse gases are doing and which ones are of most importance. So this, this is an attempt by the EPA to, to uh, de demonstrate the relative strength of different greenhouse gases. You can see the carbon dioxide in green is the biggest greenhouse gas uh, forcing term in our climate today. But the others are important too, methane, nitrous oxide shown in orange and yellow, and then some chlorofluorocarbons in purple and pink. And the reason carbon dioxide is so important is, is largely just because it's in the highest concentrations in our atmosphere today, and we produce more of it than any other, other gas. But uh, these other gases actually on a molecule per molecule basis tend to be much more potent greenhouse gases than CO2. So we really need to con <coughs> consider controlling all of these gases and the emissions of all of them. And we have here a concentration curves in our atmosphere for all the gases I just showed you. You can see CO2 going up year by year. Unfortunately, nitrous oxide going up year after year. Methane also going up year after year. But what's that in the, uh, with the lower left here? The chlorofluorocarbons, it, they're not increasing in concentration anymore. In the 1990s, they just quit increasing in concentration. You might wonder why. The reason for that is because in the 1980s, the world's leaders, political leaders, took scientists very seriously about the fact that we were destroying our ozone layer by emitting chlorofluorocarbons. They passed the Montreal Protocol in 1987, and we've controlled CFC emissions ever since. And, and, and so this, this, this uh, set of graphs speaks to several things. One, we're changing the composition of our global atmosphere. Two, when we behave appropriately, we can manage our emissions. We can do it. And three, once we do manage our emissions, they, those gases don't go away. These pollutants are going to stay up there for a while. Those chlorofluorocarbons are still in our atmosphere. It's going to take hundreds to thousands of years for some of those to actually purge from the atmospheric system naturally. So <clears throat> we take one more step back and look at a 2,000 years of, of the three primary greenhouse gases. And this really gives you a sense of just how much we've changed our, our atmosphere, the chemical composition of it. And unfortunately, this graph is actually about 12 years old, so all those gases have gone up since then. I've written down the latest values. Since the Industrial Revolution, since about 1900, uh, CO2 has in increased in our atmosphere by almost 50 percent, um, methane by almost 200 percent, nitrous oxide by about 20 percent. So <clears throat> we understand the, you know, the basics of you know, why the climate's changing, but where are these greenhouse gases coming from exactly? Let's, let's dig into this a little bit so we understand how to control them. First of all, this is an Oxfam estimate, so I can't speak completely to the, the accuracy of it, but the estimate is that of lifestyle greenhouse gas emissions, the, the wealthiest 10 percent of our global population has produced about 50 percent of those emissions, and the poorest 50 percent of our global population has produced just 10 percent. Uh, in terms of national emission profiles, cumulative Cumulatively, the United States has, has, has produced far more CO2 than any other nation in the world. And when we think in terms of how much we each produce per capita, how much CO2 emissions we have on average as Americans or as other uh, members of other nationalities, we see that the Canadians, the Americans, the Australians, uh, people from Saudi Arabia and Qatar are really leading the world in terms of our, our CO2 emissions. 
Um, but there's been a real change in the national profile of emissions in the last two decades. In the early aughts, China brought on uh, into action a whole bunch of coal-fired power plants. And when they did, you can see that their emission profile leaped dramatically. Coal is the dirtiest fossil fuel, and, and, Ch and China really brought a quite a few of them online. The other thing you can see in this graph is that the EU and the United States has been slowly decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions for a while. And there's a number of reasons for this. Some of them are simply economic market forces. We are moving to cleaner energies, whether people like it or not. Some of it has to do with various little treaties and clean air acts within, our, uh, within national, uh, international boundaries. So I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into where these gases come from. This is where we can really figure out how we can control them. As far, and I'm going to use the United States as an example, but it generalizes somewhat to the rest of the world. So carbon dioxide, straight up a third of our CO2 emissions comes from electrical power consumption, electrical power use. And why would that be? You might think, oh, I mean, aren't, uh, aren't electrical vehicle, electric vehicles going to save us or something? It really depends on where the electricity comes from. Most of our electrical power generation, uh, in the United States, about 40% actually, is coal fire based. Lots of our power plants are combustion based. So even though you're using that electricity at home, you're not producing the CO2 at home, it's being produced elsewhere. Um, you see a 30% is 32% uh, related to transportation. I'm sure that won't surprise anybody. 15% by industry. Let's look at methane. Methane, 38% of our fossil fuel emissions are, are I mean, 38% thir uh, of our emissions are directly linked to the fossil fuel industry. When you're, ex you know, doing strip mining to get to coal, whether you're ex uh, pulling gas out of the ground or you're looking for oil, you're often releasing methane in, into the atmosphere. So this is a primary way that we're driving methane uh, in, in the atmosphere today. Another third is due to livestock, these concentrated area feeding operations where the beef industry has is, is put together lots of cows. Cows' digestive process creates methane, and then the manure, manure creates methane. This is why uh, vegans and vegetarians have a claim to a more ecologically friendly lifestyle. 18% um, landfills, not, not a particularly big surprise. Methane is a, a stinky gas, and you would know it if, if you were at a landfill. Nitrous oxide, 80% of it's from agriculture. This has to do with the fact that fertilizers are nitrogen. Uh, plant fertilizers typically involve nitrogen, and the production and the application of these nitrogen fertilizers has put a lot of nitrogen into our soil, a lot of it into our water, and a lot of it into our atmosphere. Uh, so uh, the, you see, again, 13% uh, of nitrogen oxide is, is due to combustion reactions, and that's because these combustion reactions are occurring in our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is 80% nitrogen gas. When you burn things in it, you're going to create some nitrogen oxide and, and, and nitrous oxide, and then you're going to get uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So, okay, we have a good sense of why the climate is changing, how we're doing it. Is it really a problem that the climate is changing? What, what's the problem? Well, there's a variety of ways of trying to break that down. This graph just is saying, look, maybe we'll look at physical effects, we'll look at ecological effects, social effects, and then there's a variety of climate feedbacks, which I'll mention some of them later. So let's look at some of the physical effects. Sea level rise, this is something that coastal communities around the world are already getting familiar with. As the ocean warms, water expands. And as that water expands, the sea level rises. Yes, there's also glacier melt that's driving sea level rise, but it's primarily the temperature increase of the, of the uh, uh, oceans. And, and a variety of areas are very vulnerable to sea level rise. This is an attempt by the USGS to, to determine how vulnerable different areas of the US are. But certainly, a lot of island countries are in serious jeopardy already. Um, and here in Southern California, the estimate is 30 to 70 percent of our beaches may be completely eroded by 2100 if there isn't significant human intervention, both in erosion control but mostly about climate change first. Extreme temperature and weather events. Unfortunately, this is also something that we're very familiar with in, uh, in Ventura County and in California. Um, as, as the temperature profile shifts, shifts to hotter and hotter weather, we're going to see more warmer weather, okay, but we're also going to see more extreme hot weather. We're going to see more droughts. We're going to see more wildfires, and in fact, we're already seeing that. Wildfire frequency is increasing in, in California. It's increasing across the country, and uh, long wildfire season, fire seasons are increasing around the world. There's, there's a variety of other physical effects, including changes in precipitation. So we've seen precipitation changes already. These can be pretty complex exactly, you know, because 
The, as the climate changes, uh, heat drives the hydrologic cycle. So some places are going to get drier, some places are going to get wetter. Um, it looks like that the northern hemisphere on average is going to lose a little bit of water. We're going to lose a little precipitation. We're seeing here, this is a 2100 estimate projected by NOAA, and it, it looks very dire for California if there isn't significant intervention in the climate system before this time. As you can see, the whole region gets quite dry. Um, Water scarcity is expected to increase as a result of that. Water scarcity is already a health problem around the world, and it's going to be a bigger problem if we don't do something about the climate. Um, in spite of the fact that we're seeing less average precipitation, there's going to be greater, or there is, this is obs observations now, we're not looking at projections, a greater uh, extreme precipitation events. So we're seeing heavy downpours more often, even though we're seeing less precipitation overall. And so this drives things like flooding and co erosion, and it's also not particularly great for, for uh, feeding crops. Natural disasters. The, the, the science on natural disasters isn't quite as clear. Um, this is from Moody's Investor Service. I believe that they, they draw this data uh, about um, uh, natural disasters from insurance claims. But it's, it's inflation adjusted, and you can see that they're seeing increases in flood uh, landslides, storms, a variety of extreme weather events, a, a similar, uh, similar type of a graph here from The Economist. And then NOAA, what NOAA did was they, they went ahead and just took all the climate and weather-related disasters that were worth over a billion dollars and graphed it out. And you can see that, oh, it's increasing. In 2017, we actually saw 15 of these over one billion dollar weather or climate related disasters. So this is going to be a real economic impact. And this is one of the things that people often argue is, oh, we, we can't hurt our economy. We're going to hurt our economy if we don't do something sooner rather than later about the climate. How about sea ice and glacier melts? Well, if you, if you ever wanted to see a mountaintop glacier, I encourage you to do it earlier rather than later. It looks like we're, we're losing glacier on every mountaintop that has it. They're melting just straight up acro across the world. Ice loss in both Greenland and Antarctica, there's a couple different graphs here. One of them's looking at square area that's been lost. The other's looking at actual mass loss. It's all decreasing. Arctic sea ice, it's been decreasing for some time now. And, and, and these, these changes have real implications. There's not just habitat loss, but there's also a climate feedback. So I'm going to mention both of these briefly. Habitat loss, we've all seen the polar bear, and it's true, this species may be in real, real jeopardy, but it's not just the polar bear. When you lose sea ice, you lose the algae on the bottom of the sea ice, you lose the zooplankton that feed on that, you, then the carp that feed on the zooplankton, and the seal that feed, feed on the carp, and then the polar bear that fed on, fed on the uh, seal. So, so there's a whole ecological cascade, and this is kind of a, the standard story when it comes to ecology. It's one of the reasons we need to be careful about the global ecology. The other thing is this climate feedback loop. Ice, snowpack, glaciers reflect most of the light incident on them. So a lot of that energy just goes right back out to space. It's, it, but when that stuff melts and it, and it leaves bare earth or sea surface, well, those surfaces are going to absorb about 70% of the energy incident on them, which means that it's going to drive global warming. So this is an example of a feedback. It's a climate-induced change that itself drives climate change. And unfortunately, it's just not the only one. There's a whole series of them. I didn't list them all. Uh, ice melt, I just mentioned. As the oceans warm, they're going to be able to absorb less heat, so they're not going to be able to mitigate what we see here on land as easily. They're going to absorb, they're going to absorb less CO2, so the CO2 at, uh, in the atmosphere is going to increase more rapidly. That's a positive feedback loop. The melting permafrost. Permafrost is, fr is permanently frozen soil, soil that is frozen all year round. As that melts, the biological and organic processes in the soil start to speed up, and they will produce methane and CO2, which is, again, going to drive global warming, another positive positive feedback loop. This, this is a slide that's really attempting to try to summarize a lot of the different effects that we're going to see uh, as a result of climate change and some of the effects that we're already seeing. Uh, and I, there's several things that I haven't mentioned yet. And uh, so changes in animal migration and life cycles, changes in plant life cycles, damaged coral. So let's start with some of these ecological effects and, 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 and get a little bit of an understanding of them. Ocean acidification is, is an issue that, that hopefully everybody's heard of, but if you haven't, it's a major, major issue. Uh, if you direct your attention to the middle lower graph here, that's sea surface pH. And the sea surface pH has declined 
for the last 40 years. And the primary reason for that, and it may not make sense at first, is when we increase the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, more carbon dioxide dissolves in the surface water bodies, including our oceans. And when that happens, more carbon dioxide is converted into carbonic acid in the, in the oceans. And that acid, of course, is decreasing pH. The waters are becoming more acidic. So for the, so here's some measurements. This is about uh, 30, 40 years of measurement. You see it in red, again, atmospheric CO2. In green, you see the sea surface, the dissolved carbon dioxide in the ocean. And then in blue, you see the pH of the sea surface decreasing year after year. And, and this is going to you know, really challenge shellfish and other uh, marine organisms that have calcium carbonate uh, exoskeletons because those exoskeletons dissolve in acidic waters. And it's also, uh, unfortunately, going to cause a real problem for coral reef. Coral reef are, are the keystone species of our ocean ecology. They provide habitat for an immense diversity of marine uh, organisms. And unfortunately, the reefs are extremely sensitive to uh, pH and to warming water. And so here, here are some pictures of before and after of the Australian Great, reef, uh, Great, Great Barrier Reef. Here's a, um, some, uh, another image from the same, same survey, but off of American Samoa. You can see a healthy reef here on, the, here on the right. And then in the middle, you can see the bleached reef where this is a stressed reach, the symbiont from the, from the coral has already exited, and then the following year, the reef is dead. And, and this is happening all around the world. This is a, a profound tragedy that I uh, don't even want to think about too much, honestly. Uh, those marine organisms that can actually move are moving, so we're seeing that or organisms like the lobster and the flounder are moving to higher latitude where the water's a little cooler. And that's a common theme in the, w in the ecological response to climate change on land as well, is that w when organisms can move, they're going to move to cooler regimes, whether that's up or it's to towards the poles. And, and that's happening in a variety of ways. Here you see in Europe, birds and butterflies heading north, a whole bunch of species in the United States, species around the world. Th some of these species are going to present particular problems for humanity. For instance, fleas and uh, ticks and uh, mosquitoes, which are, are able to carry and transmit pathogens, are going to have expanded ranges. And so human populations that have never encountered the Zika virus or malaria or, or um, dengue fever are going to be seeing things that they've never seen before. <coughs> And all this negativity about climate change, you've got, you got to wonder, isn't something good going to happen with it? And maybe, maybe so. Uh, here, you know, you, we have one of these before and after shots again. And it, it looks like, well, OK, maybe we lose some of these species, but we're going to have new, new plants and new opportunities for life. The Arctic is greening. And there is some truth to that. Um, when we look at agricultural productivity, and this is a projection again, it looks like most of the world is going to suffer. But if, as long as climate change doesn't you know, increase temperatures over two degrees, there's going to be a, a few areas in the northern latitudes that are actually going to see increased agricultural productivity. It's partly due to precipitation. It's, it's, it's due to longer growing seasons. Um, <clears throat> so, but that's, again, it's, it's, it's within a certain degree of range of, of warming. Uh, when we look at natural habitats, the biomes are shifting northwards, as you can see here. And studies over and over again, it looks like this is tree diversity in the eastern uh, continental US. It looks like the diversity of the organisms in these biomes is going to decrease every time we have these habitat shifts. And you know, a biodiversity is kind of the fundamental metric for the health of an ecosystem. So you know, ecologists have looked at all these different e ecosystems in, in great detail. And unfortunately, it looks like biodiversity is going to be declining everywhere as a result of a changing climate. Animal, uh, and NASA has this, uh, this study here where they've, they've looked at what they expect to happen in, in different uh, biomes around the world. And their estimates are that without serious intervention, we may see 40% of biomes have complete alterations from forest to grassland or grassland to desert um, by 2100. So <clears throat> animal species around the world are really facing several challenges. They're facing temperature extremes, droughts, habitat shifts storms and flooding, and a variety of other events. And these are exactly the kinds of things that humans are also facing. So, so the issue for us, you know, uh, well, before I get to that, like, m m let me remind you that this is all temperature dependent. So some of these changes we're already seeing. We're seeing the glacier loss. We're seeing the loss of coral reef. Some of these changes haven't yet had occurred, and we still have some opportunity to do something about it. So, so what can be done? 
And, and what I can say about that is we're organizing, people are organizing on every scale from international governance to state governments to municipalities and lo local organizations and on the household level. And that's why we're here today is to hear this panel really help all of us understand what we can do within Ventura County. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our distinguished panel and thank you for, for your attention.